Hallelujah. Are you, are you pumped up this morning? Good. I'm going to try not to ruin that. If you're new to all peoples, it's a different flavor here. Sorry. You're right. I'm not. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. We are in the middle of an examination of the fear of the Lord. Together as a church, I'm sure you've seen, we're going through the book, The Awe of God by John Bevere on Wednesday nights. Not everybody can make it out during the midweek service, so I'm also teaching on it uh, on Sundays. And I'm trying my best as the Spirit leads to stick to kind of where John is going through his book so we're all getting the same message. Don't worry, this message stands on its own, so even though it's week four, you're not going to be left out based on what we're talking about. The message today is entitled, The Two Ways to Approach God. The Two Ways to Approach God. There's only two more weeks after this. I hope it's adjusting your perspective. I hope it's bringing you closer to God. We learned that in the first week, didn't we? That the fear of the Lord draws you in. It does not repel you. It draws you in. It does not repel you. Today we're going to talk more about that. We're going to talk about our approach to God. I said in the first lesson that I believe the number one problem facing Christians today is that they do not fear the Lord. They believe foolishly that they can come near to God in just any old way that they find comfortable and reassuring, and it is just not truth. We sang lovely songs this morning, didn't we? Thank you, E41. Weren't the words to those songs lovely? What did they all talk about? They all talked about what God has done for us, right? Predominantly through Jesus. It's nice, isn't it? Don't you love singing about what Jesus has done for you? Mm -hmm. He didn't do that just because. Today I'm going to prove to you from the Word of God that uh, uh, we can't just come to Him in any old way. The mindset that you can approach God on your own terms is nothing new. Human beings have been attempting to approach God on their own terms since time began. This morning we're going to be looking in the book of Isaiah. If you'll turn with me to chapter 66, the final chapter of Isaiah, if you don't have your Bibles this morning... The verses will be on the screen for you. Are you ready? You sure? You're about to see how that young lady that came up here that shared that vision with you, how that lines up with what I'm about to say. Verse 1. Thus says the Lord. It's always a good place to start. Thus says the Lord. Heaven is my throne. And earth is my footstool. What did she say that she saw in the vision? What did she see? God enthroned in heaven, yeah? And where were we? There with him in heavenly places. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brethren who hated you. 
who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. The sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. Who's confused? That was a lot. We're going to break it down. Here's the first approach to God. Your way. The first approach to God is your way. In these verses, the Lord is prophesying to believers. He's prophesying to believers who believe they can approach him on their own terms, under their own efforts, with their own perspectives, and their own opinions. I like how the verses start. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. We would go a long, long way in our walk with the Lord if you would remember just that. Do yourself the favor of spending time just meditating on the greatness of God. He is enthroned in heaven and his feet rest on this planet there is absolutely nothing that is happening in any realm of existence that in any way is even remotely a threat to who he is those things that believe that they are somehow in charge, that believe that they have some sort of power, that believe that somehow they are going to prevail over what he has declared and what he has done. It's, it's laughable. It's laughable. The picture of God sitting on his throne using the earth as a footstool is akin to a picture of you or I sitting on our porch. Anybody, ever, anybody got a porch you sit on? Me and my wife have a porch we sit on. We watch the sunset almost every night because God gave us this great view of the sunset every evening. But it's like sitting out there with your feet up and looking down and seeing that old sugar ant crawl across the concrete. And wouldn't it be something if that sugar ant all of a sudden decided to talk to us and tell us what he was going to do? <laughs> oh, I'm going to come up there and I'm going to move you on out of the way. Right, you're laughing. That's what the Lord does in the heavens. He's laughing. <laughs> Game over. It's that easy. Only pure, unadulterated pride could lead someone to believe that they could have anything to say against such an authority. Now, he's addressing his people when he says, Where is the house that you will build for me, and where is the place of my rest? In other words, you who think you're going to come near me on your own terms... Just what do you think you're going to offer me? Just what is it that you think you're building that could possibly contribute to my kingdom? What is somehow so important that you think you could possibly move who I am? What are you going to offer the Almighty? The Ancient of Days, the bright and morning star, the one who comes with fire in his nostrils and his chariots and heavenly host behind him. What, pray tell, are you going to offer him? 
The Lord says, all those things my hand has made and all those things exist. In other words, there's nothing that we can give to the Lord that he hasn't already made and given to himself. Those things, including heaven and earth, only exist because he wants them to. And if at every moment he decided he didn't want them to exist, guess what? In a vapor. And yet we have people who casually want to be in relationship with him, doing what they want, thinking what they want, acting how they want. What, what possibly could you be thinking? What possibly could you be thinking you are offering to him? It's laughable. It's laughable. You cannot come to God in a way and in a measure other than he has prescribed. And yet tens of thousands of believers, if not hundreds of thousands of believers, are doing just that day after day, week after week. It's quiet. Verse 3. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. Look at what the Lord is saying here. These were all the ways that you brought worship to God. It's part of how we know he's speaking to believers. Unbelievers didn't bring him offerings. These things that God mentions here were legitimate forms of belief. The problem was they were, they were combined with illegitimate forms of practice. I'll say that again. Legitimate forms of belief. Illegitimate forms of practice. It's the difference of prescribed versus proscribed. These things were prescribed by God. These, when, you, when you're prescribed something... When the doctor prescribes something to you, he recommends to you or she recommends to you a course of treatment, something that is beneficial. If something is proscribed, that's a thing that's prohibited. These things were prescribed by God, yet in the way that they were offered, in the posture that they were offered, those very things became profane. God began to lay these things out in Leviticus, the first chapter of Leviticus. In verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you, when any one of you, are there any one of us in the room? When any one of you, Brings an offering to the Lord. You shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. And from that verse, God begins to spend the next three chapters talking about offering bulls and sheep and birds and grain offerings. These are sacred things the Lord commands his children of Israel. His prescription for righteous worship. And he's saying something here in Isaiah 66 when he addresses those things. We better be paying attention. The next move of God in this country is going to be marked by a reverence of God and the fear of the Lord. And if we don't get what he's saying here, we run great and terrible risk. Great and terrible risk of approaching him in his glory in just any old way. Look at what he says. He who kills a bull as if he slays a man. Why were bulls offered? Where's my theologians? Why were bulls offered? Bulls were offered for the atonement of sin and to express your devotion. They signified your covenant promise with God. When you offered a bull, you cut covenant with the Lord. And look at what God says. When you offer me a bull, 
when you profess your covenant with me, when you profess to me what your salvation will look like, when you tell me how it's going to go living out that covenant between you and me, when you're informing me how that's going to work versus me informing you, it's like murder. What you think is religious and faithful and right and devoted. I see it as murder. Woof. If you're new to all peoples, we say that. When people say really good things, we say woof. Try it with me. (laughs) He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. Why were sheep offered? Why were sheep offered? Maybe we should read it. It's important. Leviticus chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. If his offering is of the flocks of the sheep or of the goats, as a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. He shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord and the priests. Aaron's son shall sprinkle its blood all around the altar. And he shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and the legs with water. Then the priest shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Did you catch what's happening there? The Israelites brought sheep or goats as a sacrifice to atone for sin. When you, as an Israelite, brought a sheep or a goat for an offering, you killed it before the Lord, not the priest. After you killed it, then the priest took its blood and sprayed it around the altar. Then you cut it into pieces with its head and its fat, and then the priest arranged it on the wood and the fire. Then you washed the guts and the legs with water. But the priest burned it on the altar to make a sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. What did it symbolize? The first thing it brought in to the worship of God was your participation. You got to see up close and personal the cost of sin. Ain't no way you came out of that ritual looking clean. Walking back to your tent, people know where you've been. Huh? Do people know where you've been when you leave this building? You didn't just come to the tent of meeting with your offering and sit around and watch the priest do his thing. Hello? Hello? The next thing it symbolized with the blood being splashed on all sides of the altar was the depiction that Jesus' sacrifice atones completely for man's sin. It covered you on all sides. Because of sin, God has claim to your life. You owe your life to him because of sin. Jesus' blood satisfies that claim for you. You no longer have to pay for your sin with your life if you are found in the Lord. And when you claim to be saved, when you claim that sacrifice of the Lamb of God on your own behalf, and then you believe you can approach God in just any old way, you might as well break a dog's neck. The symbol of the dog in Scripture is one of reproach. One of humiliation. 
Dogs symbolize people outside of the church that do not heed the voice of God in the New Testament. You want one of the biggest arguments against sloppy grace in the Bible? It's right there. When you wear the sacrifice of the lamb and approach God on your own terms, you might as well break a dog's neck. It is a reproach and an offense to God. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. What did the grain offering represent? The grain offering represented worship and thankfulness for God's provision. Worship and thankfulness for God's provision. And God says when you approach him in a way other than what he prescribes, your worship and your thankfulness are like an offering of pig's blood. Woo. What does pig's blood represent? First thing it represents is something that's unclean. Pigs and dogs, for that matter, were both unclean animals. The next thing pigs represented was God's destruction. In Psalm 80, there's a prayer of repent to the Lord. And it talks about how the wild boars are ravaging the countryside because God has abandoned his people who will not submit. The next thing it represents is from this verse in Isaiah, a rejection of worship. When you're living your Christian life out of your own opinion and your own perspective and what you think you should be doing versus what God says you should be doing, you can come in here and sing and dance and play great instruments and jump around and do all the things that you do, and God's rejection of that worship is extended towards you. You are wasting your time. The last two things pigs symbolize in Scripture is foolishness and ungratefulness. All of those things portray what it means to approach God from your perspective of how he should be approached. It is unclean. You are headed for destruction. Their worship is rejected. They are foolish and they are ungrateful for what God has done for us through Jesus. Notice the last thing God says here. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. What does the offering of incense represent? What's in golden bowls before the throne of God that comes up as incense into his nostrils? The prayers of the saints. When you are approaching God on your own terms, when you pray, you're directing your prayers to an idol. Totally correct. Because when you've created the circumstances by which you're going to approach God, you're not praying to him. You're praying to a God that you have created in your own image. You believe you're in relationship with him. You're not. You are worshiping an idol. One of the commentators I read said this. Idolatry nearly always masquerades as faithfulness. And people choose the forms of idolatry that they adopt. When you create an idol, a God in your own image, you've created something that can be manipulated. This is the number one reason why people reject the true worship of God. Because he can't be manipulated. No means no. You ever had a two-year-old that never, never understood what no meant? They're a joy, aren't they? We laugh about it, don't we? Oh, isn't that cute? Look at that funny video on TikTok. Talk to me in four years. I've had them laugh at me. Oh, Pastor, you just so... Yeah, I mean, you go be in that warden guy again. You're just so, you're so hard on people. Okay. Talk to me in four years. It's easy to fashion an idol and adopt 
your own perspective because the posture of your heart is self-centered, self-exalting. Manipulation is easy. You get to control everything. It's the epitome of Satanism, the exaltation of self. And it's done in the name of worship, legitimate belief, illegitimate practice. Now, I want, to, want you to see what happens to people like this. I told you in week one, there's great deception coming, a great falling away. These are those that are most susceptible. The end of verse 3. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called... No one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Remember, these are believers. But they are believers who have chosen their own way, their own approach. And not only do they have their own approach, they delight in their own approach. They're proud of it. It's an interesting choice of words the Lord uses People I talk to will say, well, you know, that's just my preference. That's just how I see things. Well, that's just what I believe. God calls it an abomination. That's a radical difference in perspective. Well, that's just what I believe. Well, that's an abomination. That's two ends of the spectrum. Is it not? Clearly not on the same page as God if you just have your opinion and he calls it an abomination. And since they insist on doing things their way, God says, okay, I will choose your delusion. I will give you the desires of your heart. Whoa. Whoa. Because... When I called, no one answered. When I spoke, you didn't listen. So it's obvious that God has already done his part in his mercy to reach them. He's tried to persuade them. He's tried to lead them. And at the end of the day, they said, nah, not interested. I want to come to you this way. Great. Which delusion shall I send you? You ever met a so-called believer who's so super spiritual? They're a nut. And some of the things they say are just delusional. How'd they get there? Jesus was the most spirit-filled man on the planet who's ever existed. He was not a nut. He didn't look at the sundial in Jerusalem and say, man, it's 412. That must be Isaiah 412. It's a sign. Hyper-spiritualizing things is carrying on with fantasy. And I get on it quite a bit. Why do I get on it? Because it's danger, 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 danger. And God says they did evil before my eyes and chose, key word there, chose, that in which I do not delight. You okay? I know you guys are worried. I'm just step all over your stuff. I'm sorry. I'm going to try not to. You okay? No? It's all right. Stick with me. Stick with me. It's good when it's great you. If you're all twisted up inside right now, it's because the Lord's putting a finger on something. Verse 5. 
Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Anybody tremble at his word? Hear the word of the Lord. Your brethren who hated you. Who cast you out for my name's sake. That said, let the Lord be glorified. That we may see your joy. The Lord says, they shall be ashamed. These people are fooled. They persecute the real children of God. And that persecution comes because they're under the impression they are doing God a service. They're walking around saying, let God be glorified. Let God be glorified. Let God be glorified. Would you be afraid of somebody who came to you in that, in that posture? Oh, brother, let God be glorified. God, take joy in what we're doing. Look how spiritual we are. Take joy, God. God says they will be ashamed. Look what happens. Verse 6. The sound of noise from the city. A voice from the temple. The voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemy. If we're in Lynchburg, I'm not going to say to you, listen to the sound from the city. Right? Right? If I'm across the river in Madison Heights and we're looking at Lynchburg, I'm going to say, listen to the sound from the city. Right? What's happened here is the people who believe they can approach God on their own terms, they've already cast out the the true children of the Lord. Verse 5, God is speaking. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. What's that noise coming from the city? The reason he can direct their attention to the city is because they've been put out of the city. What's that noise? That noise is a voice. Where's that voice coming from? Oh, it's coming from the temple. Well, who's left in the temple if we're out here? Oh, those ones offering bulls like murder. Offering sheep like breaking a dog's neck. Offering worship that offends like pig's blood. Offering prayers to a false god. That's who's left in the temple. Who shows up? Oh, the vo- that's the voice of the Lord I hear coming from the temple. Who's that? Mm, the one that fully repays his enemies. What's the noise? What's the tumult? The vengeance of God. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Not a pretty picture, huh? How people got started down that path, those who were left in the temple was their approach for God, or approach to God. Otherwise known as posture. It's right back there on that first big blue sign. Posture. The second approach, his way. How do we approach him? He says in verse 2, But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Three qualifications for rightly approaching God. Number one, poor. Not poor as in no money. Poor as in the recognition of your need that you are weak. We've done nothing to warrant relationship with God. He owes us nothing. We deserve nothing. We have nothing to offer. We are poor. Number two, contrite. What is contrite? A broken spirit. Submitted. Genuinely repentant. No one needs to tell you what you should do. You know what you should do. Humble yourself and repent. You're not making excuses. You're not pointing the finger at everyone else. You're not focusing on or trying to focus the lens on ancillary issues that mean nothing. You're not trying to dodge responsibility or shift blame. You take ownership of the situation and you repent. And number three, 
you are one who trembles at the word of God. In other words, you fear the Lord. How do we tremble at the word of God? We obey. That's it. We obey. We hold what he says in such high esteem, we immediately obey. I was thinking of this word, obedience. It is such a terrible word. It's awful. There's others like it. Authority. Submission. Go out into society right now and start talking about obedience, honoring authority, and submission and see what kind of response you get. They'll kill you. They'll kill you in today's day and age. Obedience is just one of those words. When you hear it, it's like someone's taking a cheese grater to your soul. Why does it feel like that? Because it's running counter to what's in us that wants to be in control. It's counter to our nature. Even if we're saved, even if we're following the Lord, we don't exactly brighten up. If I came in here and said, hey, guess what? The next four weeks we're going to spend on obedience. Most of you would go on vacation, <laughs> including me. Because we just don't get jazzed up about that word, right? We bristle at it. The degree to which you bristle at the word of obedience is the same degree to which that old man in you is still alive that needs to be put to death. Put him to death. It's the only way. It's the only way. The alternative is you're in the temple when he comes. Legitimate belief, illegitimate practice. When the voice of the one who fully repays his enemies shows up, that's the alternative. There really is no other choice. The other option is not really an option. Now, don't be mad at me. I'm merely reading you what's in the book. For those of you who've never been here before, you'd be like, man, when's this guy going to be done? We don't, we don't need to visit this place no more. Don't be mad at me. God is the one who's speaking here. He said this, not me. I'm telling you what it means. Invariably, someone will come up to me after this message and go, well, you know, I just don't really believe God works that way. <laughs> okay. You can believe that if you want. But you need to realize the position you put yourself in when you say that. If you believe that God really don't work that way, then what you're saying in effect is that he is a liar. Because he says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. You who think you can come to me in any old way, this is what I'm going to do. And if he's a liar, why do you come here at all? If he's a liar, what's the point? I'm going to go fishing and have a beer. Sorry, being honest. Some of you are like, oh, yeah, let's, let's do that. <laughs> I saw you. I saw the way some of your faces lit up. I saw you. God's not a liar. And when he says in his own word, that this is what people are doing, and this is how I'm going to respond, and you come along and say, you know, I really don't believe you're going to do that, then you, my friend, are the very person he's talking about. You've made God in your own image and not in his because how he's chosen to respond doesn't sit well with you. My advice would, to you would be, release God from your judgment. You're in no position to judge him. And the longer you persist in that posture, the greater you run the risk of him choosing your delusion. And if he sends it to you, 
If that happens, save by the absolute sheer grace and mercy of God, there will be nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do to help you. The other thing, people say, well, Pastor, that was the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it is. Sure is. The last chapters of Isaiah are widely regarded by just about every biblical scholar on the planet as portraying the return of Jesus and the establishment of the eternal kingdom of God on the new earth. So while it might be in the Old Testament, it is a prophetic message to all of God's people about how he's going to bring the show and wrap it up. So yeah, it's in the Old Testament. And this posture of rejecting what we don't like about God is how the problem of countership worship has developed in the church in the first place. It's how idolatry began at the very beginning. We reject that which is truth and we replace it with a lie. God has done us the favor of fully disclosing who he is, how he acts, what he thinks, what he commands, what he expects, and what he requires of us. And through the millennia, people have looked at all of that and some have said, yeah, I don't really like that part about God. Well, he didn't ask you. I don't really like that part about God, so I'm just going to believe something else. It's how tolerance of sin crept into the church. It's how homosexuality has crept into the church. It's how transgender issues are now creeping into the church. It's how sloppy grace has crept into the church. It's how a lack of the fear of the Lord has gripped the church of Jesus Christ today. It's like taking your Bible and tearing the pages out of it that you don't like. All over the church, people are doing that. They overemphasize the parts of God they really love, and they neglect the parts they don't. I spoke to you about this over two years ago. It was Halloween of 2020, almost three years ago. How many of you remember the time I said, poop? More than any other time you heard poop in a message. (laughs) Several hands. I spoke about vegetables. And what I said at that time is there's times that I just complain to the Lord about what he tells me to speak on. I say, God, you got to give me something encouraging for your people. I really want to love on them this week. I want them to... Be built up. I want them to hear E41, be all excited, be pumped, go out on a high, you know. Tell us about the great plans for the future. Tell us about, man, the kingdom of God is great. He loves you. Be encouraged. Have a great week. (laughs) And he'll say, yeah, I need you to speak on the fear of the Lord. No, that ain't what I asked. See, you're not listening to me. Yeah, I need you to speak on authority. No, no, no. See, that's not encouraging. We'll talk about truth then. No, see, I mean, it's going to great people the wrong way. The people are trying to kill me. This is what I said three years ago. I'm not trying to be hard on anyone. I'm not trying to bash the church. I'm not even trying to be depressing, but here's the rub. I don't do you any favors if I gloss over the truth. And it's more than just truth. It's the gospel of Jesus. And this is the picture the Lord showed me as I was complaining to him three years ago about saying heavy things to the church. It's a very vivid picture I saw as I prayed. A lot of what comes out of this pulpit is hard and difficult. We serve a lot of meat here, not a lot of milk. Every once in a while, when Phil preaches, we have milk. It's just, just a joke. 
At least it's whole milk. You're right. It's, it's more like heavy whipping cream. But the Lord said to me, I'm in correction mode. You know, John on Wednesday night, he stole, he stole my illustration. He said, we're in this ditch, and we went right over the road in the other ditch. He got that from me. But this is what the Lord said to me three years ago. There's been an overindulgence of the soft and the encouraging and the fluffy in the church at large. The church at large is sick, and the statistics prove it, and we've done it to ourselves. We're not grounded in the Word of God, and there are man-made doctrines pervasively woven into the church. And the vision I saw was that of children eating, and what I saw were children of various ages. A lot of them were between 10 and 12 years old. That's what they looked like to me, and they all had bottles of milk, bottles of warm milk in their mouths, and they're all sucking on bottles. And other kids who were the same age, they were obese because of all the ice cream and sweets that they ate. And the children were perfectly content in everything they were eating. Why wouldn't they be? Why wouldn't they be? They had huge smiles on their faces. They loved it. And they had absolutely no idea how unhealthy they were. They were deceived. And the Lord said to me, my church in America is just like that. We've had decades and decades worth of ice cream and fruit and sweet things that taste nice. And we've neglected our spiritual vegetables. The Bible, if you will eat it, is a balanced diet. There's milk in there for the babies. It's perfectly normal to have spiritual babies. You know that? Some people are spiritual babies. It's completely acceptable to be a spiritual baby. The problem comes into play when you're four years old in the Lord and you're still a baby. If you had a four-year-old that still used a pacifier, still drank milk from a bottle with a nipple, still wore a diaper, and still pooped his pants, that would be a problem. People would look at you, they might not say anything, but they'd look at you and say, man, what's up with that? That kid needs to grow up. Right? Wouldn't they say that? Yeah, what are the parents doing? But we see people in the church that are four years old in the Lord, and they're still walking around pooping their diaper. Something wrong with that. What are the parents doing? It's not okay. Four-year-olds might have accidents. 84-year-olds might have accidents. It's okay. It's called an accident for a reason. Hello? Right? Because sometimes it just happens. It just happens. We all got a story. You only tell it to your closest friends, but we all got a story. Sometimes it just happens. But when you're still crapping in your pants when you're 12, there's a problem. That's what I said three years ago. We didn't even have transgender stuff in the church three years ago. Look where we are now. But the posture of rejecting what we don't like about God is this problem, is how this got started. And what happens when you do that is people's hearts and minds form strongholds against him, and the adversary of your souls is more than happy to partner with you in that delusion. And because to you it's not sinful, you're doing great. And the adversary says, yeah, keep on thinking that. Keep on walking right this way. Yep, come on, that's it. Be encouraged. Oh, you're just too spiritual. That's why they don't get you. Come on. Follow. Yeah, that's it. Come on, right this way. And we're... So common. I spoke on the reality of hell. I don't remember when it was. Earlier this year, maybe. I heard those very things. Well, Pastor, I just really don't think God's going to do that. He's not going to just send people to hell like that. 
Well, then you think God's a liar. Because that's what he tells us he's going to do very plainly and on multiple occasions all throughout the scriptures. So when you say, he's not really going to do that, well, then he's a liar. And I have to ask you why you're here. I certainly would not follow someone that is a liar. One of the reasons I follow the Lord is because he is the only source of truth. If I can't count on him to do what he says when it comes to hell and those that have despised his name, how can I count on him to do what he says when it comes to me? We're going to close. I want to leave you with this. The church of Jesus Christ needs to humble themselves and repent. He is God. We are not. I have to tell you, God is not a buffet. I really hate it when I go to a restaurant and the menu says, no substitutions allowed. God is like one of those restaurants. There's no substitutions. You get all of him just the way he comes, including the gravy. Or you get none of him, and you can go somewhere else. That's the only choice. If we're going to approach God, it has to be on his terms. If we're going to cut covenant with God, it has to be on his terms. If we're going to ask him to forgive our sins, it has to be on his terms. If we're going to offer him thankfulness and worship, it's got to be on his terms. And if we're going to pray to him, it's got to be on his terms. And we have to tremble at his word. It's the fear of the Lord and it's the only way. It's the only way. Prayer ministers, you can come up. This altar is going to be open today because there may be those among us, I'll tell you, including myself, who at times have decided that we want to approach God on our terms. Maybe some of you are living like that now. I implore you. Come to God on his terms. Come to God on his terms while you have a chance. Don't be engaged in legitimate belief. You might love Jesus. There's a lot of people that love Jesus. There's a lot of people that love Jesus, but they're not coming to him on his terms. They're coming to him on theirs. He's calling. He's calling. Will you answer? Will you answer? When he speaks, will you listen? Will you listen? Stand to your feet. I'm not even going to pray to close. I just want you to begin to come from all over the room. Just begin to come. Begin, begin to confess to the Lord. God, I've not followed you. I've not come to you on your terms. I've tried to come to you my own way. I've tried to do what I wanted to do my own way. I've offered you worship. I've asked you to forgive my sins. I've tried to be in relationship with you by offering my bulls and my sheep and my grain and my incense my own way. 
Precious, precious Spirit of God, have mercy on us. Have mercy, O oh God. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, root out the wickedness in us. Forgive us, Lord. Renew a right spirit in us. Renew a right spirit in us, I pray. God, look upon your people with favor, I ask. I thank you that you are calling this morning. I thank you that there are those that need to heed your voice. I pray that they have, would have the courage to come. And like that old song we sang this morning, lay it all down on your altar. As our brother continues to play, I want you to come. If you don't feel you need to come, that's good. I pray that is the case. The Lord be with you. You may go in peace. If you need to come, come and seek the Lord while he may be found.